Coming up on Windows Weekly, Paul Therott has been trying out the convertible Dell Inspiron Duo, and he will give you his unadorned, unabridged, true opinion of it. Also, we get a call from Russia and find out what Microsoft's been up to over there. And is Google beating Microsoft? We'll get to the bottom of the new Chrome OS coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 186, recorded December 9th, 2010. Russia calling. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Ford and the new 2011 Ford Fiesta with an EPA estimated 40 highway miles per gallon. No other compact car is more fuel efficient. Drive one this week at a dealer near you. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For 10% off the lifetime of your account, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code WINDOWS. And by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with the leader in remote support software. GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit GoToAssist.com slash Windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that goes into everything Windows with the star of the show, Paul Therott, news editor for Windows IT Pro, man in charge of WindsuperSite.com and author of Windows Phone Secrets. The man, the verifiable fact. He's no myth. He's right here. See, look at him. I am a man. How's, how's it going, Paul? <laughs> that much I can say. Good. How have you been? Hey, it's good to be back on Windows Weekly. Uh, Leo's off at Le Web mm -hmm. eating croissants and hobnobbing with the stars, and, and we're left here to, uh, to possibly cover the stranded show. by the snow. I hear Paris yeah. is under some kind of a snowstorm disaster. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're all snowed in. I, I was reading uh, on Instagram, of all places, this morning <laughs> that, that Sarah Lane yep. had to walk across the entire city. Right. Well, they should do that anyway. It's fun. She, yeah, actually, she said, I win Paris after that. <laughs> nice. But uh, we, we don't need France. We don't need snow. We don't need strangely pre-articled web words. We've got Windows news. Pre-articled, like lur. I was trying with like la, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, the yeah. web. The web, yeah. Do okay. they have a French word for web? Uh, no, uh, you know uh, this is controversial in France, right? Because a lot of these newer computer mm -hmm. terms are English, and they don't like that. So uh, they've tried to invent their own terms to match. I don't know about web in particular. They don't have a W uh, in French. But you know, like a uh, computer, for example, I think is something like ordinateur. Yeah, right. right. Uh, something like that, or, or even. My, my friend from France is probably laughing at me right now. La connexion uh, des ordinateurs. Yeah, it's a something, uh, right. So it's like a, a new version of a typewriter, essentially. Right. Is that, what that <laughs> the electric is. typewriter conference. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let's, uh, let's start off with, the, with our first topic, the Dell mm -hmm. Inspiron Duo. Yes. Um, only because of my, I've been a little under the weather lately, uh, so I haven't gotten to this yet, but... I received this Dell convertible laptop. You've probably seen it in the ads. You know, it's the one with the flip around screen. and It's sleek. Uh, this, it looks cool. It does it nifty cool. tricks. And it is the stupidest, biggest waste of time. <laughs> uh, it is an absolute disaster. Really? And, wow. I'm yes, shocked yeah. that a, uh, a computer that in, in rumor mode looked amazing turns out to be disappointing in person. I know. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, Unfathomable. Right. I, you know, I, I've been down on the whole PC-based tablet thing for a long time. And as the iPod has became, you know, become very popular, people have been writing to me. And I know, you know, my uh, contacts at Microsoft talk about this a lot. You know, people are looking for a PC-based alternative to the iPad. And, and Microsoft, and I would say the industry's response to this has been really slow. And honestly, I, I've known for a long time that this year, it's just not going to happen, you know. Uh, the HP Slate sort of limped out of the gates there, and now we've got this Dell Inspiron Duo, you know, convertible tablet. And I'm telling you that neither one of these things is worth a damn, and you really just need to stay away from this thing. <laughs> it is absolutely a train wreck. Well, what makes it so bad? I mean, so many people have tried this convertible 
approach. Yeah. And we so we saw the ThinkPad U51 at CES last year. Right. That's still right. yet to arrive, if it ever will. Uh, mm -hmm. This this looked like an interesting take on it. What makes it so awful? There, there's nothing inherently wrong with a convertible tablet in the sense that it, it is essentially a, a laptop computer that occasionally you can flip it around and use it as a tablet. And I think that's the point. Uh, this one is a little hokey. You can see if if you're watching the video, you can see a picture of it now, where the screen actually rotates within the bezel for the screen, if you will. It's kind of hard to explain, but easier to, to understand when you see it. Um, that results in a couple of interesting side effects. One is compared to the size and weight of the machine, the screen's really small. You know, um, not only is there a bezel around which it rotates, but there's also a bezel around the screen itself. So you've got a double bezel. Re resulting it looks in like a big picture frame that the screen is inside, and it's like you take yeah. the picture out of the frame and rotate it, yeah. which it's leaves dumb. a lot of unused real estate. E exactly, exactly. And even in devices like the iPad, or if you look at a, the new MacBook Air is a good example of this, it's surprising to me on these really thin and small devices how much extra space there is on the outside, you know, from the screen to the edge of the device. There's an amazing amount of space. And on this Dell device, there's twice as much as there needs to be because of this bezel design they use. If you look at the, the video you're looking at now, you can see all of the empty space around the screen. Um, the device itself is heavy. Um, it's big. You know, uh, the screen is, is small. <laughs> it's kind of like the worst possible combinations of things. And then the battery life is unbelievably bad. You know, in a day and age uh, where we see uh, netbooks and iPads, they get eight to ten hours of battery life routinely. This thing gets maybe three and a half hours, Oof. if you're lucky. And that's that's ridiculous. You know, this is a highly portable device. It's as it's bad something, as my MacBook Pro. Yeah, it needs to run all day long, and it just doesn't even come close. So I'm actually going to be returning it uh, in and taking a, a financial loss of some kind on that because some I just kind of can't. Restocking fee or something. Yeah, whatever it is. I, I can't, it's ridiculous, and I, I just want to be very upfront about this. I I got the device specifically because. I've gotten so many calls, you know, uh, requests from people. You got to, you know, write about this, write about this, you know. And, uh, okay, <laughs> you know, I kind of went into it thinking, well, maybe it won't be as bad as I think it's going to be. And it's it's actually worse, you know. Uh, <laughs> Dell has a, a custom UI for when it's in that slate mode that is slower than molasses and, and is actually a number of different applications. So there's, a, there's one application that's sort of the front-end UI. And when you click on something like, say, videos... It actually shuts down and then runs a videos application. Mm. So these things, I mean, it's really, it's the whole thing is very hokey. And and is maybe emblematic of the problem here, which is just that the PC industry is coming late to this iPad party. And so the responses are late in coming. And of course, the initial responses are just not, you know, they're not the A game. So... Um, what, what's, what's disturbing, well, I don't know if disturbing is the right word, but what's weird about that is... They're not late. The ta there's been Windows tablets since, I don't know, since the early 2000s, whatever we call this decade. And yep. then Apple swoops in with their their form factor and their, their operating system, and then suddenly everybody's playing catch-up when they should have been ahead. Why did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Um, two reasons. I, I think that you're right. I mean, the PC industry, Microsoft, however you want to say it, was ahead of the game in some ways with the tablet PC, but the tablet PC was not what people wanted. You know, that. The tablet PC, as originally envisioned, was uh, actually a slate PC like the iPad. And, of course, that's okay for a very small number of people when you're talking about a, an actual computer, you know, a, a computer that's going to run Word and Excel and all those productivity applications. So the convertible laptop was a very early innovation in this space. Now, I think it was, uh, I want to say it was Acer that came up with it, but I could be wrong about that. And it was an attempt to make a device that was more broadly acceptable. And... You know, as a as a form factor of sorts, I guess it does make sense. You know, if you very occasionally need to write with your finger or a stylus on the screen, but need to type, you know, the other ninety seven percent of the time, a convertible laptop makes some sense. You know, the the, the early ones were hobbled by the hardware of the day and all that, but uh, it makes some sense. Yeah, was I will it, say was it that, Acer or was it Dell that had the the advertisement where the guy leans, you know, he's on the airplane and the seat <laughs> comes back and then he just converts it into a <laughs> right. tablet? No problem. Oh, I don't actually I don't remember that. I'm sorry. That, that was know. the the original convertible that I knew. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm surprised I can't Toshiba, remember this. Toshiba, maybe. 
Toshiba was one of the, the early ones. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I would say of that generation of tablet PCs, the the two Toshiba designs were probably the most popular in a very small pond, you know, uh, and and were the most decent because they were decent laptops. You know, uh, the thing about those though is that for most people, most people uh, can type far faster than they can handwrite, and of course, it's easier to understand and and more easily shareable and all that, but. You know, I would be in these meetings occasionally. Someone would draw something on the whiteboard, and you'd think, wow, it would be so neat if I had a tablet PC and I could draw what they're drawing. But then you realize I have a digital camera in my phone. I can just take a picture of it. What's <laughs> yeah. the, you know, what's the difference? So I, I just think for from the PC industry's perspective, they pursued the tablet PC as a PC. And it just was a PC with compromise. It could do some additional stuff, but not that many people needed that additional stuff. I I think the reason that Apple has been successful, it's multifold, but I mean, you could point to things like a much simpler UI. You know, they didn't base it on this big, complicated beast of the past. They based it on this much simpler, smaller thing that was proven to be very popular with you know, phones and MP3 players. And then, uh, you, know, they, you know, it gets killer battery life. Um, it's an awesome game machine. It's a great reading device. It's a fun consumption device. You know, in an era where people really aren't creating content they're just watching movies or reading email or ims or playing games or whatever that you know they're sort of it's an entertainment device you know that just really hit it from a completely different standpoint and uh you know the pc industry now is racing to catch up but i think it's a weird thing to say but it's going to be next year before they basically get back to where they were before mm. in the sense that i think we'll see very thin and light and powerful machines they get great battery life, but then you still have the operating system problem. You know, Windows 7 is a great version of Windows. It's a great operating system for PCs, but I'm not convinced that it's ever going to be workable on a device that you interact with with your hands. And, you know, this Dell Inspiron do approves that to me, certainly. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's little things. Even, even the Dell UIs that Dell custom created for this device have little little things you got to tap on with your fingers and they're, they're tiny and uh, you know, not always, but I mean, there's just a couple of things in there where you can see, you know, the mindset of the people that create this stuff, they're, they're PC people and it's just not a touch device. Hence the pressure uh, to make windows phone seven available on tablets, but Microsoft's resisting that does Microsoft yes. not have a tablet operating system right now? In well, no, what they have is Windows 7, right? So right. they, they previously had a special version of windows that was a tablet version of the OS. They've, pushed all that functionality right into Windows. Um, the functionality is basically exposed on a device if you have certain capabilities. So it supports, uh, you know, different touch points, you know, two to four to possibly eight. I don't remember what the maximum number of touch points is. And that's based on the quality of the screen. And if it's there, you get it. And if it's not, you don't. So it's it's just the way it works. You could have a, a touch screen, uh, you know, connected to your desktop computer. And for all intents and purposes to the underlying software would seem like a tablet pc even though it might be a huge you know 30 inch monitor with multi-touch built in instead yeah intel uh announced this week that intel chips are going to power 35 tablets by the end of 2011 and uh, a good yep. dozen of those are, are microsoft windows so we're going to see tablets with windows absolutely and and that's that announcement is tied to what i've been saying for a while which is that micro uh, intel rather has platforms coming out not until 2011 that are going to be more appropriate for these devices, you know, where you reach the point where it's powerful, the graphics work fast enough, and it gets great battery life. It's, the, it's just the type of thing you don't really see on these machines today. Have you seen the Samsung Gloria? I've seen the picture of it. This is the one with yeah. the, the keyboard that slides out. Is that is that a better <laughs> interface than this convertible thing where we just slide the... It seems like that would be even harder because you'd have to lay it flat and type. No, have you ever? Do you remember the OQO? Yes, I do. That's what. That, that's all it is. It's, it's a little a, it's a big. Thinner, is it a little bigger than the OQO? Though? Yeah, bigger yeah. screen. But I mean, I'm same same theory, right? Mm. Uh, it's there will always be someone anytime you criticize any of these devices, whether you're talking about tablet PCs or convertible laptops or the OQO or whatever it is. There's always someone who says, "Oh, but that thing's perfect for me. I don't understand what you're complaining about." The problem is, there's only like 17 of you, <laughs> and you know, for the rest of us, there are it doesn't make sense. Nine billion people in the world. Make something right, and, and it's going to be right for somebody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's a ridiculous looking machine. <laughs> it's this the picture you're showing right Is that now. The, that's the Gloria? 
It's terrible. Yeah, it is the OQO. It is the uh, OQO. Yeah, yeah, OQO yeah, it's slide, yeah. 2011. All right. Uh, Russia has uh, backed down on using copyright violation of Microsoft software as a way to go after groups they don't like. Uh, and Microsoft sort of has rode to the rescue on this issue, right? <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you were going to catch the sarcasm in what I wrote. So, <laughs> you know, the New York Times in September came out with this report where they said Microsoft is actually aiding uh, a totalitarian government, specifically Russia in this case, but also other governments, uh, by helping them go after dissident groups by filing or okaying bogus software privacy charges so that they can use that as a pretext to go in and, and raid the offices, seize their computers, and, and stop them from doing something. Usually, you know, maybe there'll be a demonstration. These things are always timed right before some political event. Now, were they so, always bogus, do we know? Or, or were there... Yeah, they were always bogus. They were always... Okay. Yeah. I'm not, not that Microsoft is not involved in legitimate charges, mm -hmm. right, of... of uh, and uh, piracy against companies. But uh, these, in Russia in particular, these things, when you can look at it. Microsoft calls them, I think, non-government organizations, you know, dissident groups, um, environmental groups, whatever, you know, whatever they might be. And there goes my phone. Welcome to the world of Paul Therott, by the way. Do you need to take that? So, <laughs> no, I do, no, I do not. L it's, listen, it's to Russia Tom, calling, really, Paul. This is really important. I have to, I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> it's Vladimir um, Putin. You don't want to talk <laughs> about this, Therott. Uh, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. You were you so, were saying that uh, Microsoft is the savior of all dissidents in Russia. No, I wasn't saying that. So <laughs> um, <laughs> when when I read that it was the New York Times that publicized that Microsoft was doing this, and of course uh, I read the New York Times every morning, and I remember reading this story in September and thinking to myself, okay, there's going to be a more nuanced version of this, you know. And then Microsoft came out and they said, yeah, we are doing that. Sorry about that. We'll stop doing it. I thought to myself, you got to be kidding me. Like there, were, there was no attempt at, you know, smoothing it out at all. It was just, yeah, yeah, we were doing that. Now, and, see, when, uh, I saw, when I saw this story, it was Microsoft, Microsoft playing uh, Louis from Casablanca. We're, we're shocked yes. that this yeah, is going yeah, on yeah, and yeah. we're going to issue blanket licenses right away. No, this was right. So that's eventually that's how they responded. So in the beginning, what they said was, um, you know, we're going to stop this behavior in Russia. They eventually expanded it to uh, some number of other countries as well, China and so forth, other totalitarian governments. And then they um, offered to uh, give these groups uh, free licenses for the software so that this wouldn't be an issue. And then in, in the case of the uh, the actual dissident group that touched off this investigation, it turns out that the the Russian government actually dropped the case against them, I think back in October. Never notified anybody, basically because the Siberian police was embarrassed by the whole thing. But the reason was Microsoft refused to support the case and wouldn't go on record and say, yeah, we thought that they were pirating our software. So they didn't have a case. And of course, what the Siberian police had done at the time was raided this group's office literally the day before they were going to have a demonstration Again, uh, regarding some environmental uh, concern that they have uh, in Siberia. And, you know, it was all done under, you know, this bogus uh, pretext. So it, it just came out uh, in the past week or so that, yeah, we, we dropped the case about two months ago. Sorry about that. Just kidding. You know, so it's, it's all, all's well that ends well, I guess. But, yeah, I, I don't know that I'd call Microsoft a hero, but at least after a sufficient amount of prodding, they finally did the right thing. Yeah, I mean, if you just want to look at the end results, this does end up being a good thing, no matter yeah. how we got yeah. there, right? I think so. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're giving them a lot of credit, but yeah, okay. I guess yes. I am. I, yes. I, I'm, I, I'm trying to balance it out somehow, but you're right. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, uh, there's no way to yeah, yeah. You know, make lemonade out of this one, but yes. Yeah. It's a very bitter lemonade. <laughs> It's that kind of lemonade that the kids forgot to put sugar on and you've just paid a dollar for and you're like, yeah, that's lemonade, I guess. All right, let's take a quick break and thank Ford, uh, makers of the Ford Fiesta, for their support of Windows Weekly. The new Ford Fiesta has an EPA estimated 40 highway miles per gallon. Uh, no other compact car is more fuel efficient than the 2011 Ford Fiesta. Special 1.6 liter engine gets them there. Of course, it has vo Ford voice activated sync, turn by turn directions, 911 assist and more. And there's a new program from Ford to check out called the 2012 Ford Fiesta Global Test Drive. Now through December 31st, 2010, submit a video to participate and you could, uh, 
in, in this sort of uh, self-actualizing part of us, uh, have $10,000 donated to a charitable cause of your choice. Now, that's nice, but uh, they'll also send you and a friend on a free trip to a secret location in Europe to test drive the all-new 2012 Ford Focus. So you get something out of it, too. All you got to do is make a video less than two minutes, uh, keep, it, keep it coherent, keep it brief, and tell them, why you want the $10,000 donated to the charity of your choice and why you should win the contest by December 31st. Upload your video at twitfordfocus.com and you could win a trip to the secret location, which is not always secret depending on which copy I'm reading. So if you listen to other shows, you might find out where it is. But you can't tell us in this show? I don't know. It says secret location on this piece of paper. I feel like hmm. I'd, I'd be, you know, risking some sort of crackdown. Is it Area 51? It's in Madrid. <laughs> Upload your video to TwinFordFocus.com by December 31st. And uh, stop by a Ford dealer and, and check out the Ford Focus. We thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. I assume you mean Madrid, New Mexico. Or New Madrid, Illinois. <laughs> no, it's in Europe. It says in Europe. I can give that much away. Uh, stop, stop pressuring me to leak. You know <laughs> what trouble that gets people in these days. That's right. That's right. Internet Explorer 9, as you say in the notes, always in beta. Uh, and uh, this week, speaking of, of being tracked, uh, adding a do not track feature. What's uh, How is this different from, say, incognito mode or some of the other things that we've seen in other browsers? Yeah, yeah you know, we're going to talk about Google a lot today, unfortunately. They're just in the news a lot this week. But it's interesting to me to draw some comparisons between Microsoft and Google, especially when we're talking about those products that they make that compete with each other. And obviously they both make a web browser, you know, so in the last two years, Google has released, I want to say eight versions of Chrome uh, on a very steady schedule. These things get updated in the background. You don't even realize it happens. I mean, I'm, I happen to be on the beta channel, so to speak for Chrome. So sometimes I go in and look at the help about and, oh, we're on version eight. When did that happen? Yeah. You, know? All right. <laughs> you don't even notice. I mean, it's just so seamless. Microsoft has a slightly more glacial approach to software development. Um, and it's, it's hard to remember this. And I, it's, it seems so unreal. I almost think it's untrue. But two, over two years ago, they announced their ambitions for IE9 at the PDC, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right in 2008. I, that's when it was. It's been two years. And I think they released the first... Uh, developer preview, you know, sometimes there's been, I think, eight of those now, and there's been a beta, there's going to be a release candidate. I mean, this is something that's been on a slow boil, you know, for a very long time. And it's very typical uh, of Microsoft, you know, to take this kind of approach to things. And it's too bad. I mean, I, I think they've learned some lessons by uh, interacting with the public as much as they had on AE9, and that's all positive and everything. But, you know, the truth is, the, the beta came out in September, it's been kind of silent ever since on the beta front. And then, you know, they can very easily respond to changing market conditions because this thing is just in a perpetual beta. So when the FTC called recently for a uh, do not track um, feature, so, so to speak, in browsers on the Internet, similar to the do not call list that we have here in the United States, at least conceptually, um, Microsoft was able to add it because, you know, this thing is, we don't know when it's going to come out. Probably next April, I think, is the my, my guess. So... In the release candidate version of Internet Explorer 9, they're going to have this, this feature added to the browser. And we'll see what it looks like. But my understanding of it, based on the conversations I've had with the company, is that it's basically implemented as, a, as, as actually two lists, a whitelist and a blacklist within the browser. By default, it will do absolutely nothing. They're not going to ship the browser with any kind of track or do not track uh, functionality. But users can find on their own and download and install these lists uh, that will prevent uh, advertisers or companies from following them across site boundaries and so forth. So it, it is, it's kind of a hard thing to say whether or not this is a big deal. I, I think it meets this, the spirit of the FTC request. Uh, it seems a little hokey and manual of a process to me. Well, yeah. How is this uh, different than just clearing your cookies or, or following generally accepted practices? Does it dig out some of those ever cookie yeah. type things? Well, it's, it's specific to certain kinds of companies. So, um, you know, there, there were browser privacy tools you probably looked at. I was, I was playing around with a, an ad, on, I think, for Firefox, actually, last night that will show you how many different companies have 
they're advertising cookie hook tendrils in there. You know, if you if you visit a site like the Wall Street Journal, uh, WSJ.com, that's a very uh, trusted and, and notable site. But yet there are, I think there were five non Wall Street Journal companies. Oh, yeah. With their feelers around in there. It's kind of crazy. You know, I noticed that website. with uh, NoScript. I run NoScript yeah. on Firefox and the amount of, of authorizations you have to give to all the different advertising companies, it's yes. kind of impressive when you go to, the, yeah. especially larger sites, larger commercial sites. Right, right. I mean, my own site has uh, had two. You know, one was Microsoft. I, I, I think we must be using the Microsoft ad platform or something. And then uh, the other one, I don't remember the name of, but, you know, the, you don't really realize these things are out there. And, and there's a, there were really simple concepts about cookies. And then the notion that cookies can follow you from site to site. And there's a way to, you know, most browsers will have an option. We, I, I need to accept cookies because the functionality is important, but I don't want the cookies to follow me from site to site, that kind of thing. So I, my understanding of the IE9 feature to come is that it's based around the notion of trusted and untrusted sites. And, uh, you know, I'm sure security firms and, and, and third parties, individuals will create these lists and publish them on the internet. You can install them into your browser and it will impact the way that your uh, browser functions online. And it's going to be interesting to see how this develops. But, you know, this is another one of those conceptual differences, I think, between Microsoft and Google. Microsoft has a lot of legacy dead with it it has to deal with. And I'm not just talking about code. I'm talking about its relationship with partners and advertisers and, uh, you know, hardware makers and, and device makers and wireless networks and all this stuff. And they really just don't want to upset anybody. And I think that if Google were to implement a feature like this, it would be automatic and you wouldn't even know it was there. Now, of course, Google has its own reasons not to because Google is one of the biggest advertisers on the Internet. So we'll see how they approach it. But, you know, Microsoft's um, implementation, at least from my understanding, is you know, somewhat typical, you know, for them. It, they'll, they'll couch it as user choice. But, I mean, ultimately what they're doing is putting the onus on the user. Right. And I think, you know, when we talked earlier about the simplicity of the iPad, we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about the simplicity of things like the Chrome OS or whatever. I think people crave less complexity. And, uh, you know, I think we already know just from uh, Facebook, for example, you know, people are giving up all kinds of privacy rights and everything just... Uh, to gain certain functionality. I, I bet a lot of people would be okay giving up a lot if they could just not have to click okay, 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 or come back to a computer that is rebooted every night or whatever, you know, just, just, to, just to have it happen. You know, just could you just make it work in the background, you know? Uh, could it just work? Although there is and a I, certain amount of choice you have to exercise if you, you're like, I, I, yeah. I'm okay with this cookie being set because I like to have Yahoo already log me in or whatever. But, uh, you know, so you, there's some preferences you have to set. But theoretically, yep. Yep. you could kind of set that up at the very beginning and it was, shouldn't change that much over time, right? Yeah, you would hope so. I mean, I, 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 it's a tough thing. I mean, uh, there's a certain class of user who will install a browser and they install anti-ad plugins and they they do you know they install these extensions that do certain things and all that and yeah it was even even if you were describing this feature about uh, cookies with yahoo i was thinking you know my mother has no understanding of what a cookie is at all let alone any of these more esoteric security features of the browser i mean mm -hmm. i think when you look at it from the standpoint of average users what they want is something that just works that is secure that is seamless that is fast and does what you want it to do you know without a lot of you know, click, check here, check here, check yeah. here. You know, uh, do what? Do you? Tr you know, you don't want to dial. The typical Windows way to do something would pop up a dialog box. You know, the Adventure ad system would like to know your information. Is this okay? You know, yes, no, maybe. You know, and, there's like, no uh, context. You don't know who's you know, that. What do I get? Yeah, like how, right. How does the average person even deal with something like that? You know, um, we don't have to know how a, an engine works to drive a car. You know, I, I think we're still stuck in a weird age with a computer where we need to know. A little too much about how things work, um, not just to use it, but to be safe online. You know, to get the best functionality out of a product, whatever it is. I mean, it's we're it's in a weird we're in a weird weird place. I think with technology. I right think now. we're finally hitting that transition. I, I've said for years, as many other people have said, that the mm -hmm. computer is still a hobbyist device, and mm -hmm. it's a, it's one of the few hobbyist devices that's used massively, and that's why we have so many problems with security and usability and this and that because we're trying to put this veneer over something right. that really is a, a, a DIY situation in many ways. And I think tablets and smartphones are, are starting to move us out of that. 
And it's why we're having so many struggles over this sort of this sort of thing. Do not track. How do how do we set this up? Because you've got yep. the older users saying, well, I want control. I want to be able to customize it. And you've got the new users, like you're saying, I don't want to think about it. I just want it to do what I want. I think a lot of people uh, would want to, you know, be able to pick up a device, whatever it, we'll call it, a computer, iPad, whatever it is, just by virtue of it being them, have it logged them in and all the security credential stuff happens. They go to Yahoo and it logs them in because they trust Yahoo. They don't ever want to be tracked anywhere by anything for any reason. I, I think that's pretty much the extent of it. You know, I... I think the reason uh, a lot of people will pick up something like an iPad and be so delighted by it is that they've spent so many years dealing with the complexity of these computer devices, which are just, you know, they do so much. They almost do too much, right? That's Steve I mean, Jobs' uh, theory is that we should limit choice so that they do just the things they do very well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would say it like limit choice, but I, yes, I mean, I don't expect my toaster to browse the internet. Right. Um, Certainly, yeah. I think we they're almost too versatile. You know, there's almost, there's too much going on. Um, there are too many variables. For most you know, people. Too many masters. Yeah, I, right. Now, they're always going to be, every time you say, have any conversation like yeah. this, you're going to hear from the guy who's like, oh, you don't understand, I need this. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need it too. <laughs> but I don't feel like I'm a, you know, necessarily a representative of how people use computers. I, I use computers for very specific purposes, but you know, maybe I'm not the average person in that regard, so. Well, your, your uh, car analogy is perfect for that. There is lots of people just drive cars and that's all they want to do is get in to turn on the engine and drive. Other people are, yep, yep. are gearheads and they want to get under there and tweak the performance of the engine. If you're, if you're ever driving down the highway and you see a car pulled over on the side of the road and the hood is up and there's a guy standing there and he's got his hands on his hip and he's looking at the engine, I guarantee you, 99 times out of 100, he do, he's not even positive that's where the engine is. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, we, we're, we're trained to kind of look at it. Yeah. You know, maybe there'll be some, oh, look, this thing is off the top, you know. Um, I, you know it's the, the same, same look people have at the invalid page fault dialogue box. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Or when you go to a, a retail store and they apologize because the computer's going slow. Yes. You know, it, could, it, it has arthritis. What, what do you mean? <laughs> you know. It's, it's slow getting going this morning. Yeah. It's feeling it hasn't had its coffee yet. Well, you, I know you like to tweak things. Now, am I right in this? You, you, you actually hand code your blog. Did I hear that I did. right? I yeah. did. So I just, last week, after 12 years of that, uh, my site was switched over from HTML and uh, classic ASP to uh, a, a more modern content, or well, a, I should say a content management <laughs> system. Um, yeah. And, and, there are reasons for that, but I, I guess the simplest way is just to say when I created the site, I didn't understand where it was going, and it was supposed to be kind of a one-off thing. Um, I knew better even in that day, you know, not to have done it that way, but yeah, yeah literally uh, yeah, 12 years later. So. I did some brilliant news that way for many, many years, uh, and then uh, I finally switched it over to a blog format later on. But I, I, I did used to take CGI scripts... Mm -hmm. uh, for and I, I took a, one of those forum modules that they had, uh, yep. and I I tweaked that so that I could actually create a private forum that would function as sort of a minimal way to publish stories without having to go in and hand code everything all the time. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. So I actually got into this a little bit last week, but back in the mid nineteen nineties, I was actually involved with the creation of dynamic websites that were based on databases on the back end it was very, very rare at the time, very, very hard to do in the Microsoft space with the Microsoft technologies of the day. It wasn't until active server pages that it became doable, but I, I was creating sites that had, at, you know, what were for the day content management systems, if you will, you know, based in, on code that I had written, but my own site was not <laughs> done with that. If you can believe that I, because again, I, it wasn't intended to be a long lived thing. You know, we don't know how life is going to take us. <laughs> Never know what life will throw at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I bring it up because Squarespace is a sponsor of Windows Weekly this week. And if you mm -hmm. don't want to have to build your own CMS from the ground up like Paul did in the 90s, you don't have to these days. There's technology for that. Squarespace is the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog, very easy to use UI. 
create and manage your website. Uh, if, if you're a beginner and you're like, ah, I can't do a website, it's too complicated, try out Squarespace. It's not that complicated. In fact, it's not complicated at all. You put in a headline in the headline field and the body in the body field, create some links, throw in a Flickr photo display widget, a form builder, a uh, Twitter widget, boom, you've got yourself a website several modules on there and if you are more than a beginner if you're like no i actually like to control the css i want to put things in particular places i've got a design eye you can do that too you can actually get in the css and tweak things around that way and still take advantage of the easy way to move stuff around when when you when you can it's the best of both worlds uh there's also an iphone app if you want to uh use that to log into your website and update it on the go check it out for free you can actually import your WordPress blog, removable type, and type pad uh, data into Squarespace. Sign up for the free account. Give it a try. No credit card needed. Just go to squarespace.com and use the offer code Windows. It's right there on the screen in the video version right now. Squarespace.com, offer code Windows. And if you decide to purchase Squarespace service, you get 10% off the lifetime of your account. Squarespace.com slash, or squarespace.com offer code Windows. Big week for Google Wait a minute. Why are we talking about Google, Paul? <laughs> well, how does this isn't bear? Windows news. <laughs> no, because I have always had a focus on obviously the Windows stuff, but also those companies and products that compete with what Microsoft is doing. And it's hard not to look at what Google announced this week and and see anything other than major competitive threat for Microsoft. You know, and it's. Uh, ooh, did we just get cut off? No, no, you're still there. Oh, I don't know Windows. why we're showing. You little yeah. squiggly sound there. Oh, oh, we have your video audio, lost. but your video, yeah. your video went away. Oh, it did. Yeah, I don't know what it's you're it's trying to hide over there. <laughs> okay, we can't is see it. it. How do I? Whatever it is. I don't know how to make it come back. There it is. Yeah. Now it's back. Oh, it came back for a second. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. It's probably Russia again. <laughs> my guess. Okay, now you're back. Oh, oh there. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. I won't touch it. No hand. My hands are up here. <laughs> hand check. Everybody. Okay. Um, so you were so, explaining Google. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, on two separate days, you know, they introduced an e-bookstore. That's more of a, uh, that was more of a competitive threat, I would say, to obviously to Amazon and, uh, and to Apple in some ways. But the other day they had an event for Chrome, uh, the web browser, also the uh, new web store, and then the Chrome OS. And each one of these things in its way is a direct competitive threat to what Microsoft is doing and represents um, both literally and then more from a kind of a background standpoint, what I think Microsoft should be doing uh, in these spaces. So when you look at something like the browser, you have something, again, we talked about this where it, you know, it revs, it revs, it revs. And I, I, I had this conversation with Microsoft earlier this year, you know, uh, talking about their new development process for i9. And this is really exciting, but, you know, why do you even have versions of this thing? You should just ship features, you know, ship, 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 ship. And I think it's, you know, it's like turning the Titanic, you know, it takes a while for them to get there. So they're, they're improving their process, but you know, you can see that what they're competing with is a browser that's gone from, I think it was 40 million users last year to 120 million this year. Um, they had less than 3% market share last year. And now they have about 10% market share. An internet um, explorer, did it dip below 50% in Europe? Is that right? I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's, yeah, it's a, I'd say it's right, a below, right at or below 50% overall. But the idea that uh, IE could ever have not been the dominant browser a few years ago would have been unthinkable. Yeah. And I think right now we're, you know, we're reaching a point where I think the browser market is going to mirror the smartphone market in the sense that they're going to be two, three, maybe uh, major players and a bunch of other smaller guys. And, you know, I, it's possible that IE will always be the number one browser or will be the number one browser for the foreseeable time. But yeah, it's not going to be the 80% thing ever mm -hmm. again. There's no way. And there's, you know, IE9 is great. Don't get me wrong. But well, I think that has made IE better. IE9 is the best Internet Explorer since, I don't know, I'd say four or five. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not sure how much of a compliment that is. Mm. Um, it's, it's a reaction, which is something I also don't like to see. Uh, you know, Intel's uh, guilty of this as well. These are the two, you know, dominant companies in their fields in many ways. And yet they haven't re been really leading the charge. You know, Intel this very week, I think, uh, announced a, a new division within the company focused on netbooks and tablets. Well, good for you guys. You know, finally jumping on that bandwagon years after the fact. I mean, 
Uh, these are the companies that should be, you know, leading the way, or at least seeing that this is where things are going. Isn't that normal, uh, though? We, we, uh, companies like Microsoft are very innovative and lead the way when they're small, right? Yep. And then as after 10, 20 years when they get big, it just becomes very difficult to recapture that spirit because you have well, too much cruft <laughs> and history inside an organization. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Um, Google, however, is a huge company, too. So maybe age is part of it as well, not just size. Mm-hmm. Um, but Google's ability to comment, uh, uh, compartmentalize and, and move very quickly, I think, is notable. They don't always do everything right. It's not like uh, you could line up products side by side and say everything Google does is great, everything Microsoft does is bad. It's not, it's not like that at all. That's not the point. It's just that IE is core to what Microsoft does because it reflects on the operating system. You know, as IE market share or usage share declines, so too does the usage share for Windows. I think IE's usage share is at a more critical stage than, say, uh, Windows is, obviously. But there's no doubt that these, not just rival you know, operating systems, traditional operating systems like Mac OS X, which has been doing very well lately, but also non-traditional operating systems, whether they come from smartphones or these tablet devices or whatever. I mean, all these things are kind of eating away at the sides, you know. Are you familiar with the uh, the foundation uh, books by Isaac Asimov? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Great. So I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm rereading this. And it's hard when you talk about the crumbling of the galactic empire. You uh -huh. know, it's hard not to look at something like this because you feel like the guy who was predicting it, you know, hundreds of years before it happens. And everyone's saying, what are you talking about? Everything, it's great. Everything's fine. It's like, You're no, Microsoft's you see? Cassandra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Or, or Harry Seldon in the case of... Uh, in the case uh, of foundation, foundation, right. Um so, except that I have no math to back this up. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel like I have been, you know, that guy, you know, in the corner that no one pays attention to saying, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this, you know, you got to do something. And uh, when I look at what Google's doing, I, I see a lot of the stuff that I think Microsoft needs to be doing. So, you know, there's a Chrome web store, for example, which is, if you haven't played with it, it's awesome. And it's a really neat way to install uh, web apps to some degree in the browser. Now, w uh, what's your position on this? Because a lot of people, including yeah. myself, to be honest, yeah. look at this and say, well, it's, it's a portal to a bunch of links to, to, to websites. Except that, except that it, it isn't just that. So, okay, what, what am I missing? Right. So some of them are. Some of them are that thing. Um, some of them, uh, and I'd, I'd have to go back and think about which, you know, and look at them and see which are which, but... Um, I read somewhere that there are basically two kinds of web apps that are in the Chrome store right now, uh, hosted apps and packaged apps. And the, what you're talking about are hosted apps. And those are just websites. You know, you could load that address in any browser, probably including IE9, and it would work just fine. And you think, well, what's the point of this? You know, what's the, so what? But the packaged apps are the ones that take advantage of those Google APIs that used to be part of the um, Google Gears technologies. And those are the ones with they the dot .crx extension, right? I, I'm not sure what the extension yeah, is, but they, they can work offline and they have other capabilities. And those are the ones that where you see the hint of this Google Chrome OS occurring already inside of Chrome because they work offline for, you know, as the most obvious example. So if you're talking about something like Gmail or Google Calendar, Google Reader or whatever it is, or a game, I think, which is a much more important um, uh, kind of example of this type of thing. You know, you can get on a plane with your laptop and you run this thing like it's an application and really, it's not so much a blurring of the lines anymore as it is literally just an application. That's how you think of it in your head anyway. And it works, you know. And those things only run in Chrome right now. Um, it's possible, you know, maybe that changes over time or whatever. But some of these apps are awesome. You know, the New York Times uh, app is awesome. Uh, Why couldn't I was a, the New York Times do that on their website, though? Is it because of that Google yeah. API? No, I, no, actually they could. And, and I'm a little confused because, and, and speaking of blurring of the lines, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I read the New York Times every morning, and, and I do, and I read it on the Kindle, but mm. I used to, at various times in my life, I have subscribed to the New York Times in different ways. I used to get the print edition, and then when I go to Europe, or when I, I should say in the past when I've gone to Europe, um, I would get the New York Times Reader, which started out as a, a Windows-specific application that used Microsoft Presentation Foundation technology, uh, to display, you could you could within Windows run this really rich version of the New York Times, which looks a lot like this Chrome app now, by the way. Uh, but you would pay for it, right? Now they still sell something called the New York Times Reader, but it's it's an Adobe Air app, mm -hmm. and that gives it various advantages. It runs on Macs and li probably on Linux, I think, and definitely on Windows as well. So it kind of spreads out the availability. 
And of course, they have iPad apps and uh, you know iPhone and Android apps and all that stuff. So this is another version of another kind of an app. But what's interesting is it's just as nice. Actually, it's arguably nicer than the one that they're still currently charging people for. You could subscribe to the New York Times through this uh, app, this other app, you know, but you could get this Chrome app now for free. You know, and it's, it's a weird blurring of the lines, you know, which one's which and which one has the best features and all that. But um, I think that the Chrome version is actually the nicest version I've seen so far, except for one thing. I don't want to read the New York Times on my computer, you know. So when something like that is available, say, on an iPad-like device, I would a tablet device or something like that. Like a Chrome OS tablet, maybe? Yes. Suddenly, that makes a lot, of, a lot, a lot of sense. Um, and, and you can see how these things become very valuable, you know, very quickly. I, I never, I don't use things like Google Docs, you know, and it's not just because it's online. It's just not as good. But you can see that the capability is there to create applications at work as well as, you know, the native Microsoft Word, Excel, and so forth applications that we now use. And um, I think the App Store is, it's notable for a few reasons. There are some very high quality apps that are, uh, I, want to, I want to call them real apps in the sense that they're packaged, you know, they're apps. They follow you from machine to machine, which is actually really exciting, um, where you can install it in one and have it appear in another automatically just by logging in. You know, that's neat. That's something I have been calling for in Windows for years and years and years. Um, and it's going to be available sort of in Windows, right, through, thanks to Google through Chrome. That's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I, yeah, and I think I, I think one of the important things about Chrome OS to pay attention to mm -hmm. is the idea that this is one of their wedges to try to get into the enterprise because that's where Microsoft is still dominating, right? And Google is, yes. is, you know, they're they're wanting to sue the uh, USDA because the USDA gave gave the contract to Microsoft and they didn't feel they were fairly heard. They're really right. butting their head up against the wall, figuring out how do we stop microsoft how do we how do we get into that marketplace because it's the one place where microsoft still has complete dominance it's really hard for google to make any headway there this is right. one one prong right i mean this is this is a way for it, them it is, yeah. to it, say it, hey it, take this take this chrome os and you can you can use citrix to get to your your hosted apps and it's on the go and you can log in on any computer so even if you don't have yours you can log into somebody else's and it's very secure uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. Uh, there are two sides to this because there's, from the consumer standpoint, you have those iPad using people we were talking about earlier who are tired of the complexity of PCs and want something thin and light they can carry around and, and not notice it's in their bag and all that stuff. And that's neat. There's, there's no reason that this Chrome OS couldn't occur on such a device. You know, that's fine. Um, I, <laughs> I would just say, too, that we're very comfortable now with this iTunes store style store. You know, an app store. Um, this is done very nicely just from a consumer standpoint. You know, it's nice. It's not like the Android marketplace, which is gross and terrible. This is actually really nice. It's pretty bright, you know, colorful and all that. It's nice. Now, the other side is the business side, like you said. And, and normally, I, I'd have to say, you know, you compare Microsoft solutions in the enterprise and Google, what Google has, and there's not much of a comparison with a few exceptions, right? I think that the the Gmail and the Google Calendar stuff and Google Apps and all that. It, interesting uh, and viable competition to exchange and SharePoint. So that's that's good. You know, Google Docs, not so much and so forth. But yeah, I, I think the most fascinating part possibly about the whole Google OS, Google Chrome OS thing was the business hook stuff. And, you know, it, it should be, it's obvious in retrospect and kind of a Monday morning quarterback kind of thing. But you know, businesses want simplicity too, right? Businesses want it to be secure by default without having to do a bunch of crazy configurations to make it happen. You know, anyone who has spent time configuring Active Directory security policies using group policy uh, knows the nightmare that can occur when uh, one policy overwrites another and you haven't done what you thought you did and you don't find out until it's implemented out in the real world and there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Now, this is a new system. It's not a 100% replacement for anything that Microsoft has or anything like that. But just as there's a huge you know, part of the consumer population that might look at a, an iPad or a Chrome OS type device and think, yep, that's enough for me. That's all I want. I don't want all this other junk. I just want it to work. I just want it to be secure. Uh, there are a lot of businesses that have a lot of users where that's what they want for those people as well. 
And they they made a pretty credible uh, demonstration, I thought, of uh, with Citrix and uh, bringing up the Citrix connector and showing how you can access all these uh, enterprise apps. I mean, I, you know, it's impossible with Google not to think back to Netscape and, and Mark Andreessen and how he was talking about he was going to re relegate Windows to this. Yeah, Netscape buggy, Constellation. I remember that. Yeah, buggy set of device drivers. That's what they were going to do. You yeah. know, and then and then you have this demonstration of Google with Citrix, Microsoft's one of Microsoft's biggest partners and closest partners, running uh, Microsoft Word and Excel and other Microsoft applications up in a server data center, up in some weird back room that nobody cares about, but you're using your cool device to access them. And as far as users are concerned, that's all they want. They don't care where the thing is. They want it to work. They want it to be seamless. And I'm not saying that this is perfect. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's there yet. I don't, I don't know. I, haven't, I don't have one. But you, when you see something like that, you realize, you know, just from a strategy standpoint, it's like these guys really do kind of get it, you know. And uh, I think a lot of the people who are holding on to some of the Microsoft stuff are doing so out of inertia almost, you know, because this is what they know. And that I think that this, I think this is going to have an effect, you know, on uh, the industry as a whole, but also on, on Microsoft. And that's why we're talking about it. I think that this is a, a wake up call. Well, because Microsoft could do all of this. They have the capability. Yep. It's just oh, yeah. that they haven't. They have the people, they have the money, they have the resources, they have the technology. They have the relationships uh, with device makers. Yep. It's all it's all there, and and this is uh, you know if I if anyone cares to know my biggest problem with Microsoft is that they don't connect the dots. I've, this has always been the case, you know. Um, you can look at any product whatsoever. If, if you think about all the things I've ever complained about, and I know there have been many, um, you know, the Xbox 360 that doesn't read NTFS formatted discs. What? <laughs> you know, um, you can pick out any technology and say, look, they have these two things that don't work together. Why? And you know, I'm sure there are political and, and other reasons for that within Microsoft. But, you know, we're reaching a point <clears throat> where other companies are, are starting to really outdo them in some core areas, not just out on the periphery, you know, but right in at the core. And Google's first, you know, entrances into the enterprise market, were, were they were cute mm -hmm. and they weren't, you know, they weren't credible. Uh, and I think we've I think we've crossed the line here. And I think it's important that Microsoft and the people who care about Microsoft, and I, I know they're out there, I mean, um, you know, need to wake up and, and respond. Not next year. You know, re responding to the iPad in 2011, eh, it's a little late. It's a little late. You can't right. do that again. You can't keep doing that. This is all very sad. Let's move on to something more <laughs> cheerful. It's week right. two of your holiday tech gift picks. So I, I had Leo do one last week. I don't know if you're interested in having a, a tech pick of some kind, but uh, to get, you don't have to, but I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, but, think, I, I think I could uh, rustle one up. Okay, so I'll, do, I'll tell you what we did last week. is uh, My tech gift pick last week was the Kindle. Okay. And uh, Leo picked the Roku device, <sighs> right? There. Okay, fine. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I've gotten a lot of questions about video games lately. I, a second Roku would be my... No. I'll, a I'll, second I'll, Roku, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I've been thinking about video games a lot. And, and, and you know, uh, there was a guy who had written me very specifically as small children. And, I'm, you know, as a Microsoft guy and as someone who actually is an Xbox enthusiast, you know, you want to be able to, rec you know, get an Xbox with a Kinect. But the truth is, um, if you have really small children, you know, in the, in the, in the single digits, um, age wise, I mean, I think a Wii still makes a lot of sense and it's certainly a lot less expensive. The games are less expensive and, and the games are also more along the lines of the types of things that those kids should be playing in the first place. And I think that's a, I think that's a good way to go. I mean, otherwise I think the Xbox 360 is absolutely the way to go, um, for almost anybody. Um, the, other, the other interesting thing I'd bring up is just, you know, portable gaming. Uh, I think we've reached the point now where the dedicated portable gaming machines don't really make a lot of sense. And that if you already have a smartphone, a modern smartphone, you know, an iPhone or Android phone, a Windows phone, um, you're all set. You know, there are great games on all those platforms. If not, if you don't have such a phone and you have no plans to get one, you know, the Apple iPod Touch, would I think, would be the way to go there just because of the rich app ecosystem that occurs there that it shares with the iPhone and there's a lot of great games, you know, the Angry Birds games and so forth. So I think there are a lot of excellent um, video game choices, uh, you know, that you can make. Tom, you're on the spot. So Kindle, <laughs> Netflix, Xbox 360, 
Um, iPod Touch. Okay, so what's left? I, you know what? I, I'm torn. There's a, there's another good streamer out there uh, from Orbit. They, uh, the, they make they make a software that mm -hmm. allows you to it work like a sling box, right? And they've now right. come up with a device that you buy for ninety nine bucks. So it's similar to a Roku, uh, but the advantage is you you plug this into your television. If you have a desktop PC on your home network, it can stream anything off of that desktop PC when you're running the, uh, the software there. Hmm. So uh, it, it's, it's a little bit less convenient. So it's not, you know, I, I, I would call the Roku my top gift because you can give that to somebody as long as they have, an, they have internet and they plug it in and they get all the advantages of it. It's, it's fairly, fairly right. easy to use. But it doesn't do any interaction with your yeah. PC. Yeah. Whereas the Orbit box will actually uh, you be, allow you to watch all of Hulu, not just Hulu Plus, uh, your Netflix, mm -hmm. anything streaming on any website, basically anything you can do off of a desktop PC uh, over there. So, I, you know, left with the uh, all of the, the <laughs> my top five picks Christ. taken away. That's that's probably where I would I would go with that. Uh, just because I, I'm probably going to buy a Kindle. Well, I, I yep. don't think my mom watches this, so it's OK. But I, I'm thinking about buying that because it's self-contained. You don't have to have a computer to use it. Once you get your account set up with Amazon, you you know all you got to do is plug it in. You can buy right over the uh, over the air. Sure, these things are all specific to people too. I mean, you know, I, the way I put it is, if you're a reader, and I mean a real reader, you know, the Kindle's the way to go. It's it's a reading device. It is optimized for that one thing. Uh, don't get it to play the Sudoku game that's available. You can do that, but that's not why you have it. If if you want lots of stuff, you know. Uh, there are iPads and, and other tablets and the PCs and whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of different devices. So, yeah. Uh, Samsung Galaxy Tab is not bad. I have still not seen one of those in person. I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I, I do think it's a good size. I think it's a, mm -hmm. you know, what I, I feel like the iPad's a little too big. Although I was, you know, it's funny. I was looking at the iPad in the, in the theme of bezel sizes. You know, if you, if you left the screen the way it was, but had it be like an edge to edge screen kind of thing. That wouldn't be a bad size either right there. You know, get rid of some of that surrounding right. plastic, you know. I, I was thinking, it, thinking about you on the drive-in. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't driving. Otherwise, this story doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Uh, my wife was driving. I was playing, trying, to, trying out the new Infinity Blade game on my iPad. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the car, sun shining, thumbprints all over the screen. I can't see a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. He was right. And I, that was immediately what I thought. I'm like, oh, Paul would... Right. Would recommend this situation as an example. <laughs> All right. Before we get to the Q and A, uh, let's thank the folks at Go to Assist Express. We mentioned Citrix earlier. If you're in tech support and you want to solve problems fast, take a look at Go to Assist Express. Brought to you by our friends at Citrix. Go to Assist was recently named the worldwide market leader in remote support by Frost and Sullivan. Uh, Go to Assist is the number one remote support solution worldwide because it's easy to use, it's affordable. And it's secure. You don't have to pre-install software on your customers' machines. That's nice. You just have to have it. And whenever your customers have a problem, you can instantly start supporting them online. You see their screen. You can work through their problems. Uh, you don't have to have them try to read everything back to you. Try Go to Assist Express free for 30 days. If you visit uh, gotoassist.com slash windows, uh, you, can, you can get that. Start your session with just one click. It's like all the services from Citrix. Works on uh, both PCs and Macs. Macs, that is, not Macs. Uh, share your screen, like I said. Diagnose the problem. Uh, access their desktop remotely. Fix the problem by accessing their files on their computer. Uh, or even transferring files from your computer to theirs. You'll solve more tech support questions quickly and help clients even when they're away from their computer. Go to Assist brought to you by Citrix. All data exchanged during your session is completely secured with 128-bit encryption. And free customer service available 24-7. Check them out. Go to assist.com slash windows. We thank you for your support, Citrix. All right. Hey, um, I, before we continue, I got I to gotta tell you about this. I just got an email. Um, I'm not sure if I should say his name, but I, somebody sent me an email and it says, you've got money. Dell Duo restocking fee fund. And he sent me $2. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and he said... This is for buying the Dell Duo and letting me know what a piece of dish it is. You've saved me the hassle of buying it and sending it back to Dell myself. I love that. 
That's great. Well, that's, um, that's I'm fantastic. Not, uh, nobody has to do that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. You but, should start uh, a Kickstarter fund for your review units from now on. Yeah, I, I don't really. I will review the Dell Duo. Right, if you pay for it. Yeah, if no, no, did, I don't. No. I, I'm not sure how comfortable I am with that. But <laughs> that's a, It's a nice thought, though. Yeah, that was nice. That's funny. <laughs> All right, so uh, Q and A time. Uh, if good. you'd uh, had, are we still working this the way it was the last time I was on, where we just uh, asked for folks to throw up their questions in the chat room. Yeah, give us a uh, question in the chat room from Paul. It can be about pretty much anything. anything. Yeah, what could go wrong? Like you know, personal life, Russian <laughs> sure. politics, My, probably uh, food poisoning episode from the weekend. Windows questions are probably more yeah, likely to, to get those you a good, good response. Uh, here we got one from Jimmy says rumors tell Windows 8 will have two desktop UIs, one called Wind. Will we be able to build our systems a la carte with different modules? Jeez. <laughs> oh, well, why not, not start I, with I, a uh, wild rumor? I, I create, yeah, I, I've not heard that. I don't know. I, I, I honestly, there's not pre, there's not a lot of uh, good info about Windows 8. Although, by the way, we are expecting to see a Windows, you know, App Store as part of it, but uh, no, I don't, I don't know about the UI stuff, sorry. What about Windows Phone 7 or, uh, update timing? Yep. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of questions about that, and there's some good information coming from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, when Windows Phone 7 launched, and actually before Windows Phone 7 launched, I was told that there was going to be a very big update um, very soon, uh, plus or minus days of launch, you know, a big, big deal, and that has never happened. And now what they're saying is that there is a small update coming in January and it's going to be basically the cut and paste stuff we promised as well as, you know, bug fixes and all that kind of stuff. So there isn't a lot of information about what's going on there. There was some uh, discredited talk about some mammoth update that was going to make it, you know, like Windows Phone OS 8, you know. Um, that's not the case, apparently. But, yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff in... Windows Phone 7 that Microsoft needs to fix. And I would hope that a lot of that stuff would be part of that first update. Uh, very basic things, you know, and I'm not talking about missing features. I'm literally talking about just little things that aren't working the way they're supposed to work. And you know, I think there's a lot of fit and finish work to be done there. So I have to say I am not just a little bit very disappointed that they haven't been addressing those on an ongoing basis. And this is just like the IE9 thing we talked about, you know, why isn't this stuff just happening seamlessly? over and over again you know just get this get fix it you know fix it it's just it's sitting there uh dejunga asked the eternal question do you think zune os will ever merge with windows phone 7 <laughs> no i mean I, I i think the zune os meaning like the zune hd os um no i think that goes away and when windows phone os becomes it i mean i think the, the obviously we talked about this one of the big hopes is that they, they pull an iPod touch and make a version of Windows Phone without the phone, and they can call it a Zune whatever, HD2 or whatever they want to call it, and sell it themselves, you know, and, and show people uh, what a Microsoft design device could look like. You know, the Zune HD never really sold very well, but it's a beautiful device, and people who have that device will tell you they love it. It's a, it's a great UI. It's a responsive screen. It's a nice little system. I mean, you know, a Windows Phone version of that would be great. RoboDog wants to know uh, what you think about Windows having roaming profiles. We kind of talked about that with Chrome OS. <laughs> it's not enough. Yeah. <laughs> Windows has had this forever. You know, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Microsoft publicized this recently. You know, they're, what they're, <laughs> um, they're calling it user virtualization, which it isn't. And, uh, or use, I should say, user state virtualization. Um, Microsoft, uh, Windows, uh, Windows Server, Windows Client has had these kind of basic capabilities for a long, long time. They're a little bit hard to implement and... Uh, not very well known, and I think that's the reason they can talk about it now and call it something different and pretend it's something new when it's not. But, you know, when you talk about Windows 8 and you look at things like uh, the simplicity of installing an application inside Google Chrome and how it follows you around as you log in, that's exactly what Windows needs to do. So this is a cute first step, but it's been with us for, you know, seven, eight, nine years, a long time. And uh, we need more than that, and we need that Chrome uh, style functionality and we need it you know we need it quick uh jazz g4 has a, a specific holiday buying question okay. black ops or medal of honor that's ridiculous next question <laughs> no, black, <laughs> black, black ops obviously what, what medal of honor yeah. medal of honor is something you give to people you don't like you okay. know because well, you you like, didn't you know black ops was out why would you give me this <laughs> unless oh. i already have 
Jones. I must have been bad this year. I got Medal of Honor in my stocking. <laughs> yeah, what is what did I do? What do you, you know? What is what is this? You don't want me to play with all the other people online? Why me? Ron H is uh, planning to build a server for the house, and he's wondering if he should still go with Windows Home Server for his box, given all of the changes and the drive extender controversy, and the fact that HP says they're not going to make the boxes anymore. Right. Um, I think we need to wait a month and see what Microsoft does with that next beta of Windows Home Server available. Because what I've heard is that they're not put, the drive extender is not coming back. Uh, they're not going to make it optional or anything like that, but. I think we're going to see something there that should appease at least some of the complaints. So let's see what happens. I, I, I think right now we're, we're just in a holding pattern, basically. Let's wait and see. Is there any software that you can use to, any good software that you'd recommend using to mimic Drive Extender? No. I, uh, there are RAID and RAID like solutions I've been looking at. None of them, nothing comes close. Nothing. I mean, the thing that comes closest conceptually is Drobo. Uh, but Drobo is a little on the expensive side, I think, for consumers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it has its great. detractors, too. I mean, I yeah. yeah, I works as far as I'm concerned, it works great. But, I mean, I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who said, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't always work. And, you know, here are some complaints that people have made about it and so forth. But uh, I think Drobo is the closest conceptually because it's the same kind of thing where you can plug in a hard drive. It goes into the pool of storage. They don't have to be the exact same drive type and size and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about any of those weird raid issues and all that so and drobo offers even additional functionality over drive extender you can have uh the redundancy go across more than just one drive you know for example so there's a lot of good stuff there not to mention uh compatibility between devices with various uh interface types including all the way up to iSCSI depending on the uh, drobo unit you get so let's let's see you know we'll, we'll wait and see i think on that one so Jehoshua wants to know if uh you have any news on windows phone 7 for verizon January. We'll find out in January or there's something coming in January? January. It should be January. Yeah. Okay. HTC. Mario, Mario Getch wants to know, Paul, how are you so good looking? Does it come naturally? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> actually, we, uh, we have a George Lucas style special effects thing going on here. I'm actually... It's a filter. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually much better looking in person, but you wouldn't be able to handle it. So we actually put a filter on. <laughs> yeah. It's a problem I have. <laughs> it's, it's a burden. Yeah, it's a burden. Uh, what about Windows Phone 7 for Sprint? There is a Windows Phone 7 for Sprint. Uh, I've heard no, of. It's, no, it's... Oh, wait. Oh, it's Sprint? Sprint's like a rumored... Uh, Sprint is the uh, CDMA yeah. carrier, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that should happen roughly the same time frame as um, Verizon. I don't have anything specific on that, but early next year... Uh, it, the intention is for it to be on all the major carriers. So, yeah. Uh, everyone asking about IE nine release dates. Paul doesn't know, do you? April. April. <laughs> or is that that's just that's your that's your that's your that's my edu estimate. educated guess. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So they released the first platform preview at Mix, which is their web developer show. Uh, Mix is usually in March, but it's happening in April this year. Kind of makes sense. You know, they're talking about a release candidate. Early in uh, 2011, the beta was in September. I think April makes a lot of sense. What about Windows 8? Mid-2012. Mid-2012. That seems pretty safe. That seems about right on schedule, right? Yeah, right on schedule. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a, uh, a beta like, uh, cons you know, comparable to the Windows 7 beta by mid next year. And then, you know, one year to release. And that's 2012, which means it's the last Windows release ever as we all die. Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks to the Mayan calendar. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just, uh, I mean, is it possible they just stopped making it? I mean, do we? did they actually foresee Doom or did they just st sort of stop working on it? Stop working I mean, on the calendar, you mean? Yeah, I mean, at like, some point eh. it seems like we're so far in the future anyway. What's the difference? Well, I, in, in all seriousness, I've read lots of people who actively debunk this saying it's a misinterpretation of the entire entire thing yeah i don't think right yeah. it wasn't their their version of revelation right. or anything right i mean i <laughs> yeah well it made for a, it made for a decent action movie for oh the yeah i mean if you like disaster porn that's yeah, the movie of the year right paul uk wants to know what the best active directory management program is <laughs> i don't even know what that means <laughs> I, I was gonna pretend like i did and hope you knew i don't know what that means i'm sorry i mean i i, I have never used well, I can't say that. I haven't used too many third-party Active Directory management tools, um, but I, I pretty much have just stuck with the Microsoft stuff, so I'm not, I'm not sure where to go with that one. I'm saying. 
CBG60 has an interesting question. Any word on SD card updates for Windows Phone 7? Because there was the whole controversy about it being built in and how you're not supposed to touch it. Uh, yeah. Is that going to yep. be is that going to be changed in future versions? Do we know anything more? I, you know, Microsoft hasn't changed their tune on that with me, and I have been very obstinate about it. I mean, I've gone back again and again, and and tried to explain to these people that you haven't really answered the question. They have zero interest in supporting this. And my understanding, based on what they've told me, is that this is a feature that the <clears throat> wireless carrier partners asked for. Uh, they explained to them that there was no way to test these things other than to literally individually test the SD cards. Uh, and they still wanted it, so they put it in there. There are, in fact, new phones that aren't out yet that are coming that will have this built in. So uh, it's going to be an ongoing issue. But, you know, as recently as just minutes before the show, I got an email from someone who had you know, uh, bought an SD card uh, from SanDisk, 16 gigabytes card, you know, the phone's having all kinds of problems. And, you know, it, it's uh, the official word from Microsoft is that's a carrier issue. If they want to support it, they can support it. And uh, AT&T sort of supports it. But, you know, uh, my own personal experience has been that I have a 16 gig card. Mine, it works fine. Um, other people have had different results. And that's the, that's pretty much what Microsoft said was going to happen. So, I don't, I don't know. I, I think this is a silly state of affairs, but I, I, it's one of many things I think they should fix about Windows 7. All right, let's, uh, one last question. Uh, what's your take on the homebrew affair with Windows Phone 7, where, where the guys came out and said, hey, we figured out how to yep. put on the homebrew apps, and then Microsoft said, we'd rather you didn't do that. We want to we wanna come up with a way to do this officially or something. Is that what it was? I have no idea. I, I, I want to be careful here because, you know, uh, a friend of mine was the guy who actually developed this um oh, i didn't know that this software yeah he was my uh, windows windows 7 secrets co-author mm -hmm. um this software is completely unnecessary because um yes in many ways windows phone is a is a closed system in the sense that you have to submit apps to uh, microsoft and they approve it and they put it up in the store and then you can sell it or give it away there are no examples yet of a, a single app that ever was submitted and got rejected. And, you know, some guy blogged about it and said, oh, I have this great app and Microsoft won't let me put it out. And it's, it's sort of a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. I'm not saying it won't exist at some point. Uh, clearly in the Apple ecosystem, because of the way Apple handles that kind of thing, uh, a jailbreaking app makes a lot of sense. You know, um, there are a lot of apps out there that you can get, you know, on a jailbroken phone that you can't get in the traditional store. Um, I just don't see the need for it. And I, I think Microsoft's response was essentially, why don't you guys work with us on this one and um, we're going to be making some changes to the way we do things and I think it should, you know, meet your needs. So um, one of the things that it, I, the one app I was aware of that had come out for the broken phone, jailbroken phone was, you know, custom ringtones or something like that. Um, again, there's, <laughs> there's nothing, I, it's not clear that this was ever, submitted to the actual store and was rejected and you know the reason was we don't want you to make this kind of app i mean i why couldn't this have just been released you know as a normal app i, I don't know so uh i thought that whole thing was kind of foolish unfortunately um except that it's, it's always fun to crack things yep but yeah other than just to but, do but it. I, it's if it if it had been released in that spirit that would have been interesting but mm -hmm. you know we're not you know, it's it's like they're freedom fighters or something. You know, this you're you're fighting a cause that doesn't exist, uh, or fighting for a cause that doesn't exist. You know, there's right. no there's no real cry for this. Um, there weren't people complaining about this. You know, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. A pleasure doing Windows Weekly again. Thanks for letting Seriously? me ride along with you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Leo will be back next week. Paul Thorat is news editor for Windows IT Pro, the man in charge of winsupersite.com, and the author of the book, Windows Phone Secrets. If you want to know the secrets, go check out the book. There's an ebook version, too? Yes, there is. So you can, uh, you can dig it up in many different formats. Check it out. That's it for Windows Weekly. I'm Tom Merritt. Leo, we'll see you next time. <laughs> what was that? Uh, Leo? Was, oh, Leo? I was about was to say, that. I'll see you next time. And I'm like, no, I won't. I won't be here. I had to really think about that one for a second. <laughs> Leo was... Yes, yes, he will. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about calling it Russia calling. <laughs>
<laughs> right. You have a, yeah, unless you have a better title. No, that's good. Right. I don't usually get input on the title, so I'm a little oh, unsure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't realize the date. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, that's good.